On today's episode, we are going to be discussing one of our favorite subjects, which is love. But before we discuss it, we are going to introduce ourselves. Carrie, who are you? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am Carrie Ganya, and I am a facilitator in a therapy called Family Constellation Therapy. I am a multi hyphenate spiritual healer that helps you clean up intergenerational trauma. And I am Mark Edgar Stevens. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist who specializes in body language and communication. And I help folks to make changes on a behavioral level, a thought level, a feeling level, and also a spiritual level. Together, we are our carrium, and we have created a structure to be able to deal with certain things during this crazy time in our world. And so today's subject being around love, we are going to ask one another two questions. Uh, I will ask Carrie two questions and Carrie will ask me two questions. And in that, we will see where we go. Carrie, are you ready? I'm ready. Favorite subject. <laughs> okay. So here's my first question to you. As somebody who does family constellation therapy and who understands love going through many generations, does love affect us through the generations? And if so, how? Your questions are phenomenal. Yes, it absolutely affects us. And I think that's been part of the issue is that love, that flow, that connection, that life force got blocked. It got blocked through addiction, through war, through pandemics, through other types of trauma. And so in family constellation therapy, they actually call it orders of love, which is basically just source, whatever you know that to be, creates your family line, gives all of that love and life force energy to the front, and then everyone fills up with that love and then they pass it forward. So my work goes in to kind of unkink the hose so that you can actually receive that love. And honestly, Mark, I feel like that is the thing that I've noticed in every session I've ever done. 99.9% .9 of people have not been able to receive that love from parents, ancestors themselves. So it's really beautiful to watch the body, the psyche, the, the emotional body respond to that love once you can actually feel that energy. Yeah. Carrie, can it get blocked on, so for instance, if one of my great grandparents or great, great grandparents had difficulty accepting love or sharing love or believing that love was possible or got hurt in something that was very loving, does their experience then affect my life as their descendant? And how does that affect my life? Absolutely. And so typically, you know, we'll use that as an example. Great grandparent can't have love for whatever, for whatever reason. If that doesn't get dealt with within the family system unconsciously, the next generation will kind of try and right that wrong. And so oftentimes I see the pattern of grandparents' generation, our parents' generation being so repressed that the system has been kind of stuck. And then we come along and we actually try and look at this stuff either consciously or unconsciously to heal it. I had a client the other day whose great grandmother came from a very wealthy family, fell in love with a very poor man and got disowned. They literally kicked her out of the system because she followed her heart. So then that subsequently set off this chain of reaction of people meeting their loves really early and then getting ripped apart for some reason. So it absolutely can affect them unconsciously. Carrie, when that happens with our great grandparents or our great, great grandparents, um, does, does it, does it affect us? Meaning that that becomes uh, sort of imprinted in our DNA or imprinted in our cellular or our soul level so that we also say, Oh, it's not safe to go for someone who's out of my social uh, or socioeconomic um, realm because they may not be accepted or I may lead to it being ostracized from my family. If I choose this love, I lose this love. Is, is that how it happens? It gets imprinted somewhere on the cellular DNA spiritual level? Absolutely. So science has now proved that we are carrying transgenerational trauma within ourselves. We are literally carrying memories, emotions, of traumas that have not happened to us. And so that imprint may show up in a different way, but for my client, she had 
like an, an aversion to getting married, even though she really wanted to. So she just avoided it at all costs. Sometimes I'll see, cause my work is just patterns. Honestly, I always tease people. It's kind of math. So I will literally see people repeat the same trauma at the same age of, you know, four generations back, which is re- really, really interesting. But love is definitely, I think it's everything in family systems. And I think all of the trauma kind of offshoots of love not flowing, people not being able to receive it, having emotionally unavailable parents being sent to war at 18. Like, you know what I mean? But I think yes. that connection being disrupted is, is everything. There is the saying that, um, you know, the sins of the father, sins of the mother. And, you know, now that science has actually proven that, that it, it does, it gets passed down. It also explains why in my work, when people come in and say, oh, I don't want to be like my mother, I don't want to be like my father. And yet everything is stacked against the odds that we are very much like our mothers and our fathers, because either we are going to follow the same pattern we're going to spend our whole lives trying not to repeat the same pattern, which usually makes it repeat, or we are going to break the pattern. And that really, I, I see those as the three primary choices. Are there other choices beyond what I just named? No, I think that's the crux of it. I feel like my mind just went like 50 different places. Two things. I actually read a New York Times article years ago when I was first learning, probably like 10 years ago, when I was first learning about epigenetics and how everything is connected, even though as a little kid, I had questions about family systems and wanted to know how it worked and how love, you know, why love wasn't being passed down. But I read this article about this man, I think he was like 45, but as a small child, he kept having dreams about the Holocaust and war and suffering and being in camps and nobody was telling him his family history and his grandfather. I mean, like everyone on the grandfather's side had perished in the Holocaust. And when he was like mid to late forties, he killed himself. So he had literally been haunted by this atrocious thing that happened within his family system, but nobody, nobody talked about it. So he was carrying the weight of that trauma and subsequently succumbed to it. And I think it's really interesting because our, our, I feel like our work is similar in a lot of ways. So I get a lot of people that come to me too and are like, oh, I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to be like my dad. I had that too. And then once I really dove into my practice and was doing so many constellations with my practitioner, it dawned on me of wow, I followed, I unconsciously followed those patterns because of love, because of loyalty, blind love, little kids, blind love with their parents, you know? And I think, I think there's something beautiful about that, but I always tell people honor them by having an easier life, having a life filled with love instead of suffering or trauma or being ripped apart from your soulmate or, you know, whatever. It's interesting what you say about the repeating of the pattern or the repeating of the behavior is um, we learn from our parents or whoever our primary parental units are, even if they are not kind to us, even if they're not loving, even if they're abusive, we tend to follow and learn about love from our primary parental units. And again, not just meaning, um, not, not just biological, but whoever it is that's raising us, we learn about life from those people. So up until about the age of 10 or 11 years old, there's a thing called the critical filter that builds up that uh, allows us to have more, to have conscious thought at the same time, reacting to the world on subconscious conditioning that happened before the age of 10 or 11 years old. And if that conditioning said that love was dangerous or love was abusive or love was um, uh, hurtful or painful, we actually subconsciously seek out those experiences to relive them again, because that's what we associate with love. And even if our conscious mind knows that, wait a minute, this isn't love to be abused or to be hurt, We still seek it out again and again, which explains that conditioning. We associate love with what was given to us or how we were cared for. And I use cared for in quotations, how we were cared for before the age of about 10 years old. And if that was a very healthy experience, then 
oftentimes the relationships moving forward are very healthy. But if those relationships were not healthy, we tend to look for relationships that will mirror what we learned from our mothers or and or our fathers and or our aunts and uncles and teachers or whoever it was that was bringing us up. So it's 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 the odds are stacked against us in that way because generationally as well as conditioning that we experience in this lifetime it wants to repeat itself over and over again which is all the more reason why it's so important to do work on a deep spiritual level that can affect love and affect forgiveness and gratitude at such a macro level that we can actually break and or change those patterns so that's exciting for me it's so exciting and i think to that point, it's so important to make the bring the unconscious into the conscious, right? Because that's when you can affect the most change and and ultimately receive the most love. Dr. Shirley calls it building the container for good. It's like really healing the nervous system, working on those attachment wounds and being able to expand and receive what it is that you want, you know? Because I know that people people typically come to us when they're feeling stuck. I hear that all the time, which is in my work, it's just trauma. There's, there's a kink in the hose somewhere. So we just have to figure out where it's kinked and Hmm. unkink it so that you can receive love and move forward. Okay. So shoot your time. Ask me a question. Okay. What? I'm so excited about this. What has been your most profound act of love in your lifetime? My most profound act of love, this, I don't know what this will sound like. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But my first thing is I'd have to say it's, it's forgiving my, for forgiving myself is my most profound act of love. And it's forgiving myself for not being perfect. It's forgiving myself for not loving fully and completely. It's forgiving myself for not forgiving. Forgive me for not forgiving. It's forgiving myself for not being grateful for everything that has happened in my life, even the things I didn't want, even the things that I was uncomfortable with, even the things that I do not wish to repeat, even as I sit here saying it, I do not wish to repeat, but I have to forgive myself for making any part of my life wrong. And in conjunction with that, making any person in my life wrong. And I want to be very clear that I have not mastered that 100%. There are still some people that I make wrong in my life. And I have to work with that on a daily level and forgive myself for that because love is always present. Love always comes in and rushes in into the empty spaces. But if those spaces, if like a closet crammed with a bunch of old clothes or boxes filled with things that you just don't need, if it's completely full, the love is competing for that space. And that space, if it's filled up with um, regret, if it's filled up with um, uh, anger, if it's filled up with resentment, if it's filled up with guilt, if it's filled up with shame, if it's filled up with blame, if it's filled up with any of those things, love competes to get into that space. It's always there, always willing to rush in and fill those spaces. My job is to empty those spaces that are filled up with the things that are not love, that are not gratitude, that are not forgiveness. And so my most loving act has been to forgive myself. And in forgiving myself, I forgive others. I forgive the world. My perspective of the world changes. And I don't think that there really is truly any greater act than forgiving ourselves because For the most part, we are, and most times, we are harder on ourselves than anyone else is. And being in a place of blame, shame, or guilt does not allow us then to reach out into the world unfettered with love, no matter what comes back. Ooh, and that's a hard one when you think about it. Like, I'm going to reach out there into the world with love no matter what it gives back to me. That's, that's, you know, mentally, that's, that's a difficult one, which is why coming back to the heart and recognizing and realizing that anyone that has that you've perceived as doing wrong to you it's because of some ignorance on their part it's because of some unconscious behavior it's because of some old patterning it's because of something there that they themselves are not in control of that they uh, have a, a an unconscious uh 
completely unconscious uh, 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 action, an unconscious behavior, and forgiving it within ourselves helps us to forgive it in others. And I believe it's the most loving thing I could do. And I do believe it's the most loving thing that any of us can do, forgive ourselves. I love, I love that you brought it back to self. I actually wasn't expecting that. So I think what a, what a beautiful reminder, you know, because I've, I, I really feel like anything that we can do to heal within ourselves heals everyone around us. And so I think it's really extraordinary that that, that has been your most profound act of love. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And being very clear, it's a work in progress. Oh, as yeah. we all are, it's a work in <laughs> yeah. progress. Yeah. All right. My next question for you is how, and, and when I ask how, I really want you to go into it from your expertise. How can we heal our own hearts? And in healing our own hearts, how does that heal the world? Like, how does love heal our hearts? And in return, how does that love then heal the world? That's a great question. I, I feel like the answer piggybacks on what you just said. I was shamed a lot as a kid. I mean, super generational, but just teased, shamed for being sensitive and being intuitive and being expressive and being free. And it really came into the world all heart. And it, I was taught early on that it was a bad thing. And so I always tell people, I'm like, the things that we were shamed for as kids or or the things that we might not have loved about ourselves are our greatest strength. It's our greatest superpower. So I think for me personally and with clients, I always take them back to, to self. I always take them back to inner kids, you know, li the littles within us that are like, oh, I can't be seen. I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I can't do that. I have to hide. I have to, you know, numb out with addiction, whatever. So I, I feel like going back and creating a really safe space for them and showing them love that is unconditional instead of conditional. There's so much conditional love in family systems and unkinking that hose, I think is, I think it's the only way, honestly, <laughs> you know, Carrie, would you talk a little bit about unconditional versus conditional love? So just to, to illuminate that, the, to, you know, the, the, what is conditional love within the family and what is unconditional love? Yeah. So conditional love within family systems is I love you if, if you're doing this, if you're behaving in this way, if you're good, getting good grades, if you're pleasing us, if you're codependent. So it's different in every family system, but it's, it's always that if. I will love you and I will show you love and attention if you're doing what I want you to do, which is, which is not how we're wired. We are here to love and to connect and to feel safe and to be expressive and to help our neighbors and to help the world and help Gaia and all of these wonderful things. But I think we have to go back and really remove that if. And I think, and I can speak for myself and it's such a process. I feel like I'm unconditional on a Monday and I'm super conditional on a Tuesday with myself. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, yeah, girl, we got this. And then the next day I'm just an asshole, you know? And so it's like going back, but instead of having judgment around that, I have a lot of self-forgiveness of like, cool, where did that program start? Where's that, <laughs> where did that belief start? You know what I mean? And then it, I just kind of trace it back to where I was loved if I was doing something good, you know, if I was the, I mean, you know, the good girl, the good boy, that all those programs in family systems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, maybe I will be loved more if I do what you want me to do. Maybe you will love me more and you will accept me and I will be worthy and deserving if I, if I show up the way you want me to show up. And so there we build good boys and good girls because love is based is conditional rather than, I love you no matter what, you know what I mean? Like I love you no matter whether you, you know, wrote on the wall or, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, ate all the cookies or wh whatever it may be. So I wrote on the wall a lot as a kid. I love that you use that example. <laughs> I was just like drawing rainbows and unicorns. I was like, Hey guys, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that was not an unconditional like moment in our, our households. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love that question. 
All right. So now you question number two for me, what do you have? Okay. How do you honor love in your daily life? Like how do you really consciously connect to love and honor it in unconditional ways in your daily life? So this is a, I'm going to answer this question very practically because I think that it is, I think you have said many times that you enjoy tools and I do think tools are very important. So I, the first thing that I do is when I wake up before I get out of bed, I actually start with my gratitudes. So I start my day with gratitude so that I can already be in a place that's love. So I will, you, I love my mattress, love my mattress. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, yeah. you know, multi-thousand dollar mattress. I got one of these really, uh, I uh, stayed with a friend years ago and I was like, this is a great mattress. And mm -hmm. she was like $300 on Amazon. So I was like, <laughs> really? It's like, this yeah. is the $300, you know, on Amazon. Yeah. It is a great mattress. So every Every night or every morning when I wake up, I go, ah, oh, thank you for a good night's sleep. Thank you for all the dreams, whether they were pleasant or not pleasant. Thank you for the love that is in my life. Thank you for my clients. Thank you for the money in my bank account. Thank you for me having shelter. Thank you for my health. Thank you for whatever the day is going to bring. And I spend a good minute and a half to two minutes just going through the gratitudes before I ever get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Then when I get out of bed, I, this, and this is a big one, I do not turn on my technology first thing. I don't turn on the phone because if I turn on the phone and I see a message from a client or something I need to take care of, mm -hmm. I'm going to give my attention to that. And the first part of the attention needs to be given to me. What am I feeling? How am I doing? Because again, if I'm not in my best feeling place, it is my job and I feel like it's my responsibility to bring myself back to my best feeling place. Mm -hmm. So how do I know what place I'm in? I journal, I write every morning and I try to get the three pages out, but sometimes it's just two, sometimes it's just one. But in that journaling, I get very clear with myself with what I'm feeling. And some mornings I'm feeling great. Some mornings I'm thinking, oh, you know, fall is here and, you know, I've got some pumpkin spice coffee, you know, you know, brewing in there. And, and it's a really great feeling. And there are other mornings that I wake up and go, God, I'm just so tired. What is this about? Why am I doing any of this? But I have to get clear with what it is that I'm feeling so that I can check into that. The next thing that I do is my deep, deliberate breathing. So I breathe in very deeply. You can call it a mini meditation. Mm -hmm. So for me, deep, deliberate breathing is all about then feeling where is this comfortable or uncomfortable feeling sitting in my body? Is it up here in my head? Is it in my throat? Is it in my heart? Is it in my solar mm -hmm. plexus? Is it my lower abdomen? Is it my shoulder, which it recently has been given? me, you know, some issues. And there's a whole thing with body mind therapy about carrying responsibility, you know, and so letting that go. And I feel where it is. And in my three breath process, one, I identify, oh, there's that uncomfortable feeling. And in the second breath, I breathe into that feeling without trying to make it go away. And on my third deep breath is a free breath. And in that free breath, almost always, I feel a sense of full body relaxation and full mental relaxation. So the benefit of writing, identifying my feeling, going into my, my deep, deliberate breathing. And by the way, all this takes place in the first 20 minutes of the morning. Mm -hmm. So that first 20 minutes is mine mm -hmm. for me to, in, and I think it's important, we have to start here before we turn out here. Because if we turn out here, not at our best or not unaware of what we're feeling, we're not giving the world our best and we're not experiencing the best inside of ourselves. So if I can consciously be in my best feeling place through my gratitudes, mm -hmm. through my journaling and through my deep deliberate breathing, then I can see what is the news of the world today, which is, you know, can really take you to a negative place if you're not in your best feeling place. What do my clients need? What's on my you know, calendar today? And then if there's time, and this is one that I still am working on, is to make sure that I take a walk, just even a short walk, 15, 20 minutes in nature every morning before I get into my day. With the change in the world that's happened in terms of uh, things slowing down a bit and nature coming out a bit more, um, all of these sorts of things. I am really looking up at the leaves. I'm looking up at the trees. I'm looking up at the sky. What does the, you know, we've had fires in California. What's the air smell like this morning? There are the squirrels asking for more this morning. There are ravens all in both of the parks that are right near me. And those ravens fly by and they've been talking to me every morning. And I pay attention to the natural world. If I've done that, that's how I've programmed my day to be filled with love because I gave myself love 
first so that I can give the most love to the world around me. Because if I didn't give myself my love, how am I going to give it to the rest of the world? How am, um, uh, what is the thing that um, uh, RuPaul says? Uh, if you can't love yourself, yeah. how, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? Yeah, so so you have to start with yeah. the love that you're giving to yourself, the love that you are feeling for yourself and the, and the self-care because then you can give to others. If I immediately start to try to, do you hear the train? I um, love the trains. They're my favorite. I am <laughs> grateful for the grandma. train. I, I grew I grew up near the, yeah. near the train track. So every time it comes through, there's my grandmother's house, you know? Yeah. And so so for me, it, it is about having a practice on a practical level that helps me get to my best feeling place. It does not mean that then every day is, you know, uh, you know, cherries and rainbows and butterflies. There are still days where the feeling can be off, but at least I've done something on a practical, actionable level that again, I have some sort of control over because I can't control everything in the external world that brings me back to my better feeling place. And I often will stop and listen to that train because and there's a, there's a kid in my neighborhood. Uh, he's got to be like two and a half, three years old. And every time that train goes, he runs out with his grandpa. They run out and try to, oh. you know, where's the train? Where's the train? And again, that's a reminder, like go yeah. back to the things that bring you joy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, last thing with all of this too is, you know, I find a good, good cup of coffee that's another self-care, yeah. self-loving act that makes my day start off really, really well. Yeah. But in the practical level, that's, that's, that's the first 20 to 30 minutes of my day. And it doesn't happen that way every day. But on the days that it does, those days tend to be days that are filled with more care and with more love. Yeah, I love that you're anchoring love at the beginning of your day because then it's easier to walk in love throughout your day. I find when I kind of abort the mission and get on my phone first thing in the morning or rush around, it's like it's harder for me to get back into that center and make loving choices or take loving actions when I'm not centered on myself before others. So thank you for that reminder. You are very welcome. And on that note, I would like to say if anyone would like to share with us any thoughts or any questions or any subjects that you would like for us to cover in Arcarium, you can write to us at talk to Arcarium at gmail.com. And that's T-A-L-K, the number two, Arcarium at gmail.com. And we will read them and we will do our best to address those things as we move forward and continue to learn and grow. And on that note, wise, compassionate, beautiful friend of mine, Carrie, would you take us out with some thoughts about your favorite subject in the world, love? Just be kind, guys. Our world needs so much love and tenderness right now. And I think if we can give that to ourselves, it will be much easier to give that to others. So love yourself up practice your tools, practice being connected to your heart, and then share it with as many people as you can.